welcome to this uh, lecture and the lecture series. Um, so basically, as, as mentioned by Shane, uh, this is an introduction to medicine and medical data. And this whole series is gonna be dealing with um, how do physicians collect patient data, what kinds of data are available, um, and how is AI being used right now? And what are some of the opportunities that exist for AI to be involved in healthcare in the future? And this specific lecture will, will be an overview of a typical patient encounter. Um, so the general stuff before we delve into uh, more of the AI and medicine uh, things. Um, as Shane mentioned, I'm a second year uh, medical student. I'm in the MD PhD program uh, here at U of A. Um, I do have a master's in neuroscience and a bachelor's in biomedical engineering and electrical engineering. So I have a little bit of the data science and AI background, and I'm also a part of a startup uh, nonprofit institute for medical AI um, that we're working on um, some of the opportunities for medical AI as well. So if there are any questions or um, comments or suggestions or anything like that related to those, uh, I'd be happy um, to talk to you. So you can email me. Um, my email was on the initial slide for that. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about? So we're gonna talk about a, a general medicine and healthcare and what they are. Um, we're gonna go through a, a typical workflow of, of um, basically a clinical workflow of a, of a disease uh, and how it presents, uh, the history and physical exam we obtain, the investigations we do um, as we go through, as we go through the, the journey, the assessments, um, plans and and the outcomes of those uh, and i'll make a small plug about privacy and safety in the end uh, in terms of data in healthcare um, so basically medicine can be um, defined as the art and science of restoring or preserving health um, and this could include diagnosis prognosis treatment and prevention of disease um, and a lot of us probably when we're thinking about medicine where we see the first three um, and sometimes the fourth one, the prevention piece doesn't get as much attention as it should. Um, and so that's one of the important pieces of medicine as well. And I believe AI is, is one, of the, um, uh, one of the ways to actually um, try and help that piece specifically. And we obviously have some of the, um, some of the physicians, for example, who are dealing with um, uh, prevention, let's say the public health physicians uh, and even primary care doctors uh, who are trying to make sure that um, we don't present with, with a more serious problem to the ER, which is usually more costly and also um, potentially more serious than the initial presentation. So that prevention piece, I just wanted to make sure that I kind of emphasize that point there. Um, and one thing that I really like, uh, one quote that I really like from Sarah William Osler um, is that the good physician treats the disease and the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And this is one of the things that's evolving in medicine of trying to look at the, the whole patient and the experience in general, rather than just looking at the disease itself that they're presenting with. There might, there might be some other comorbidities. The patients might have some um, other social determinants of health that we might be, we, we need to be aware of. Um, and so I think this is, this is a pretty good quote to, to think about when we're um, going through um, basically seeing a patient and, and trying to treat the disease. <clears throat> so what is the healthcare system? Again, this is a very brief um, uh, introduction to the healthcare system because we're not really going to talk about the um, insurance, insurance um, system and, and for example, the, the public versus private um, dichotomy that's out there. Um, but just the, the basic idea of, of healthcare is, is healthcare system is that the organization financing and delivery of, of healthcare and medicine and provision of medicine. And there are multiple individuals and stakeholders. And the reason I've included this here is that every one of these stakeholders and individuals are collecting data. And this comes in handy for AI because we need data and AI, as you might know. Um, and so some of these stakeholders that I have, their names here, physicians, nurses, um, allied health partners like physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, um, and administrative assistants, they're all collecting data. There, there are different types of data that they're collecting and we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit about those, um, but these are basically the, some of the stakeholders and individuals in the healthcare system that are collecting, um, collecting data. And so, as I mentioned, AI is data hungry. So we need data for, um, for whatever AI algorithm that 
uh, we're going to be using. And but some of the some of the challenges for that is that access to healthcare data is not easy. It's it's a very big challenge. There are a lot of regulations. There's privacy issues, patient confidentiality, um, consent, and things like that are are important pieces. Uh, and those those could actually be sometimes could be barriers. Um, and there are many sources of health data. So if you look at your smartphones, your smartwatches, other devices, they're constantly collecting data. Some of those data could actually be used as healthcare data, um, and and that that's coming in coming in handy with with AI and healthcare and AI and medicine as well. Um, some of the medical devices um, are are collecting data. Actually, I said I should probably say all of medical devices are collecting data. Uh, they're looking at blood pressure, oxygenation levels, and things like that. Um, patient charts um, are all sources of healthcare data. Insurance claims are, are sources of um, health data. And so those are some of the things that we need to um, we need to keep in mind when we're looking at data and healthcare. So there's a huge variety of data that uh, gets collected in, in, in medicine. Um, and some of the major types are, are texts, images, and videos, for example. So there are chart notes, um, there, there are x-rays, um, surgical recordings or seizure events that could be used. Um, there are also some other types. So numerical values that we might get from labs, um, some vital signs information, um, signals, if you're looking at the heart, the ECG signals, if you're looking at the brain, the EEG signals, um, the audio and auditory signals that we, we uh, collect as well. So we listen to the heart with a stethoscope or we might percuss um, and I will um, demonstrate some of these in a little bit. Um, so these are the, the huge variety of data that we collect um, in medicine. And again, um, AI could really come in handy in trying to put all of these together um, and, and come up with um, with ways to, to better the healthcare system. Um, I would like to put a little bit of a plug to the to, to patient journey here. And it's it's really important to think about the continuity of care from the patient's perspective. And and um, basically if you look at a, a and, and this goes back to, to the code I shared in the beginning, that the patient is going to be seeing a lot of different uh, stakeholders in the healthcare system. They're going to be seeing a lot of healthcare providers. Um, are they in constant, they're going to be in constant communication with each other. At least we hope they will be. Um, and again, AI is something that could actually come in handy and help in here. So you go see your family doc, you go see um, a, a general practitioner in a walk-in clinic. Um, you might go to the emergency department. Um, there are people who, who get hospitalized. There, obviously, we, we go through pharmacies and things like that for, for, for me medical uh, treatments. So these are some of the, some of the ar areas in healthcare that we use their services. And these people should be in constant communication with each other to make sure that there is continuity of care. So this was a big problem when we were using paper charts, and I believe we still are using them in some hospitals. I've seen this being used still. Um, but with electronic medical records, like the system Connect Care, who's coming in in Alberta, um, this is becoming much easier to have that continuity of care because then you're CCing a bunch of people who are in, in, in care, like basically caring for this patient, and they would, be, uh, they would know what exactly is going on. Uh, in terms of a specific diagnosis. And, and this becomes especially important when we're thinking of uh, chronic disease. So I do have an infographic here. So these are 10 common chronic conditions for adults 65 plus. Uh, and this is from the National Council on Aging um, from the US. Um, and this is data from a couple of years ago. So these numbers might have increased by um, at this point. Um, but basically, if you look at it, about 80% of, um, of adults over 65 have at least one chronic condition. And 68% have two or more chronic conditions. So if you think about that, that's, that's a lot of different types of um, healthcare providers they might have to see, a lot of different types of treatments they, have, they might have to undergo. And, and so again, this is a very complex situation and AI could come in to help with and un untangle this complexity um, for let's say for hypertension, for high cholesterol, arthritis, some of these diseases that we, we actually see abundantly in, especially in the older age adult group. So clinical workflow is, is basically the other side of this journey. So, so patient's journey is, like I mentioned, patients often see multiple healthcare providers um, to get to that appropriate treatment that they want and they need. Uh, they undergo multiple investigations and treatment plans and lab works and um, and things like that. And, and this is when, when they look from their perspective, this is a lot of work from, for the patient. So if you're looking at 
um, for example, if AI could come in, ha could come in and help the patient from the patient's perspective for their chronic disease, that that would actually be a uh, potentially a good opportunity uh, to do that. And 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 when I'm talking about AI could come in handy, these probably could be ideas. Uh, if you are thinking of working on an AI project, these probably could be ideas that you could to, you could take away from from today's uh, from today's lecture. Um, so the other side of this is basically the clinical workflow. So these are two somewhat different sides of the same coin, but the clinical workflow is the physician's journey, the physician's perspective of treating the patient. Um, what care has the patient has already have already received from other healthcare providers and or or potentially from the same healthcare provider as well. And so clinical workflow looks from the from the healthcare systems perspective, from the doctor's perspective, um, and it might be that 10 minutes um, of coming and seeing a physician or that 20 minutes of going in and doing some lab work. But a, a patient who potentially might be dealing with a chronic disease situation is dealing with this day in and day out. And this is this is something that we need to we need to make sure that we understand is that most of the time when we're looking at the clinical side of things, we're looking at the clinical workflow, but rather there is just trying to understand that there is a patient journey in here and there's a patient side um, that we need to we need to think about as well. Um, so this is a sample clinical workflow I have here. Um, so let's say a patient comes in. Um, and they present with, with a specific set of symptoms. So I will go through each one of these like history, physical exam presentation, things like that in, in just a bit in each of the slides. But I would just like to go through this um, workflow uh, real quick here um, for you to understand how it works in general, just, just, just to have a general idea of how, how, the, how the system works. So a patient might present with right lower quadrant pain, let's say. So basically in the trunk, we uh, divide the trunk into four quadrants. Um, so we have the right and left upper and lower quadrants, um, and there are specific organs and tissues in each one of those quadrants. And based on the pain being localized in one of those quadrants, we could we could kind of figure out where this pain is coming from and what tissue or organ could be could be the problem here. So once you present, once someone presents with that, um, the the physician is going to be obtaining history and physical exam. So this is one place that AI could come in handy in terms of obtaining the history, trying to get to that. Um, initial presentation and 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 getting some of the symptoms that the patient presents with, um, and once we we've done some of those, we 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 try and understand whether we are concerned about this patient or we're not. If we're concerned and we think that this might be appendicitis, this is one of the serious cases of right lower quadrant pain. So in that case, we would send the patient to the ER. Uh, ER is going to confirm the the. Um, the diagnosis. A surgery could be done, appendectomy to remove the appendix. Um, and we are using robots um, for, for surgeries right now, but they're not being used uh, automatically and they're not autonomous, um, but, but these are controlled by surgeons. And then once that uh, surgery is done, the patient is assessed for complications as, as it is for, for many of the other surgeries as well. Uh, and if we are concerned, we keep uh, monitoring them to make sure that they, the, the complications are going to go away. And then once we're, we're, uh, we think that the patient is fine, then that's when the patient, the patient gets discharged and they come up with, for a follow-up. Now, AI could help with, with assessing those complications in there to make sure that there are, there are no um, other complications and monitor them uh, constantly. Now, let's go back to where we were uh, trying to make the decision about concerned and not concerned. Um, and if we are not concerned, in that case, we would do more investigations to figure out what's going on. Um, and so we might order imaging, lab work, things like that. And then, um, again, this is some, somewhere AI could help with and, and, and do some of those investigations or look at the results of those investigations and help us make decisions about whether we see what we are supposed to be seeing in those, um, in those investigations and reports. Um, once that's done, the patient comes in for a follow-up, a different diagnosis could be confirmed, um, a treatment would be initiated, and the patient would come in for follow-up. And like I said, this is a very, very simple workflow. Um, not, it's not always this, um, this easy and, and um, basically structured. Um, and another thing that I would like to mention is that that list of differential diagnoses and, and, and a different diagnosis, confirmation of different diagnosis could actually be through AI as well. Like I said, again, we're going to go through these in a little bit more detail in just a bit. So an organizational framework that uh, physicians use in patient care is called SOAP, or basically the way we make the notes, it's called SOAP notes. Um, it's basically the first letters of subjective, objective assessment and plan. 
So for subjective, we're looking at the subjective measures. What is the patient presenting with? What are the history items? These are things that the patient actually describes. And in objective, we look at the physical exam, um, we, exams that we perform and investigations. These are the signs that the patient presents with, and these are the objective things that we see as, 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 as physicians. Um, and then the, we assess all of these um, together and we come up with a plan, obviously, with the patient uh, to make sure that patient autonomy is there as well. So let's talk about each one of these categories. Um, so for subjective, in terms of presentation, so what symptoms cause the patient to seek medical care? Uh, so let's say a patient comes in with three days of headache and vomiting, and we're gonna look at how the patient describes them. And we need to make sure that we, we understand that different patients may have different descriptions for the same symptom. Weakness of the leg could mean something to, for, some, to, for someone, could mean something else to someone else. Um, so coming in and, and uh, describing some of these vague words and, um, and uh, things like that, we, we have, to, as, as physicians, we have to make sure that we understand what exactly is going on at a biological level there, uh, rather than just a, just a general term of, of weakness, let's say. Um, occasionally, the diagnosis is very obvious. So you look at the patient, they might have specific signs and symptoms that uh, clue in a specific diagnosis, and it's, it's very obvious. They're, it's not that simple oftentimes, though. Um, and, and, and signs can actually be very subtle. And computers can be good at looking at those subtle signs than a human eye could be. Um, so this is, this is another place that uh, the computers could actually come in handy. And one of the other components of presentation is the visual presentation of the patient. So when the patient comes in, we look at the patient, um, do they look sick? Do they, are, are they sweaty, for example? Do they have slurred speech? It's like some of, the th some of these things that tell you whether the, the patient is really sick and something very serious is going on and you need to act really fast or they're, they're comfortable, they're not in too much pain, they can still talk. Um, and then at that point, you, you move on to history. If they're not, they're actually very sick at that point, then uh, you probably need to do a little, uh, uh, basically this is more of a serious situation and you probably need to be a little quick uh, in terms of what you wanna do. So an example of uh, how AI can help with presentation is collecting that preliminary data or data that has been collected as preliminary can be used in AI algorithms. So chatbot based symptom checkers, for example, um, I, I have Babylon here, which is a symptom checker. They use deep learning to search based knowledge tree. And there is um, a, an image of it there. And I know there is a lot of controversy in terms of Babylon and TELUS coming into Canada and stuff like that. We're not gonna talk about that today. Um, but basically this is an idea of some of the things that already exist out there. So Wobot is, is a chatbot for, for depression. Medwat is, in Q, is a Q&A system for medical questions. Beyond Verbal is, is for psychiatric conditions um, and they use voice analysis um, to actually detect those conditions. So the second component of subjective is, is the history. So the, the doctor uses a standard framework to collect mo more information from the patient other than just a presentation. So this is where there is that standard, that standard framework comes, comes handy again. But one of the things that we need to make sure we understand is that sometimes we have to digress from the standard framework. So someone, let's say they're talking about loss of a loved one. Um, as, as a human being, as, as, an, as a physician, that's supposed to look at everything um, and supposed to treat the patient rather than just a disease, you actually ask about how they're dealing with that. You might be in the middle of asking questions about their surgical history, but they bring this up. Obviously, you're going to go, go through that um, discussion before you come back to and take them back to the, to the, rest, of the, to the rest of the framework. Um, and this, this is important if you're actually building an AI algorithm to do this, um, to make sure that they, they are capable of, of doing that. So the components of, of the history, we, we look at chief complaint, how the patient presents, um, the three days of headache and vomiting, for example, in the previous slides could be this, um, the history of presenting illness. So what happened when, um, that, that this, um, when, and when, when it happened and, and things like that, and, and have you tried anything for it? Um, we talk about past medical history, surgical history, family history, social history and review of systems, and I will go through each one of these uh, in just a bit more detail in just a bit. Um, so history of presenting illness, as I mentioned, is that when, when did it happen? What might have caused it? What were you doing right before it? Um, and have you, any, have you tried anything that has made it worse or better? Uh, so that might clue in a few specific diseases or diagnoses, or might rule out some of them as well.
um, in past medical history, we, we ask whether this has happened before. Do they have any other medical conditions like any other comorbidities? We ask about medications, immunizations, and allergies. Um, and we usually try to ask about over-the-counter medications and, and um, drugs like marijuana and things like that that they might be using as well. Um, and, obviously, and, and we also ask about allergies because we want to make sure we're not giving them a treatment that, might, that they might be allergic to later on. Uh, family history is important, uh, especially in medical conditions that could have risk factors for people in the family, or they might be a genetic cause. Um, so again, this is this is another um, this is another place that we would we would have a little bit more data in terms of, um, for example, let's say specific cancers could run into family, um, or um, specific risk factors. If if someone in the family had that disease before, there's a higher chance that the people in the next generation would have that disease as well. Um, so these are the reasons why we ask these questions in terms of family history. And then we also ask about surgical history, any invasive procedures that they've done. Um, before and and this will again clue in some of the some of the contraindications and consider special considerations that we might have um, and social and sexual history. So this is where we talk about barriers to treatment, some of the social determinants of of health. Uh, so if you're prescribing a specific um, uh, specific medication. Uh, is the patient actually capable of, of buying that medication? Do they have enough coverage to, to, to buy that medication that potentially could be very costly? Um, and then in terms of sexual history, this is also uh, a, a bit of a, um, I guess, um, topic that you don't ask all the time, um, but this is uh, used to, um, for example, let's say if we think that there might be a sexual in infection going on, um, at that, in, in that case, we would ask those, or if this is a meet and greet between um, your family doc and, and they're trying to have a, a general history of what's going on in your life, um, that's when that's asked. And, and so basically these, most of these data, that, this data that we actually um, collect during the history phase um, and the presentation phase, uh, phase uh, is verbal and auditory. So, and, and some of the visual observations as well. And, and most of these become text, uh, textual, basically textual information in the charts. Uh, sometimes we might have some images depending on what exactly the condition is. If there is a dermatological condition, we might have an image from that as well. Um, but gen generally it's verbal and auditory data. And then we also do review of systems. So we look at head and neck in general, we look at trunk and the internal organs. So we might ask uh, some of the problems they might have. Do you have shortness of breath? Or do you have um, vomiting or diarrhea or any urinary symptoms? Um, we ask about extremities and we also ask about constitutional symptoms. So these are um, some, of the, some of the symptoms that might, uh, might rule in or rule out some of the serious conditions. Um, so we think about fevers and chills, night sweats, unintentional weight loss. These could um, potentially come in handy to, to, to figure out whether there is um, a serious condition going on. Let's say cancer would be going on or something like that. Um, and so once we have all of this information from the history and presentation phase, we develop an initial list of differential diagnosis. Um, and this is already a huge amount of data. And uh, most of this, as, as I said before, goes into the patient's chart. So potentially NLP could come in handy to, um, to actually look at this data and, and process it that way. Now, the objective part is looking for signs. So these are the objective measures as the, we see as the physician. So physical exam is one of the things that we do. And then, like I mentioned, the general appearance comes in um, it, when you're doing physical exams as well. Uh, and sometimes vital signs have been done before you get into a presentation, but most of the time it's also done during the physical exam part as well. So we look at heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, temperature and blood oxygenation and things like that to, to, to see if something systemic might be going on. And then we do something called IPPA. So IPPA is basically the first letters of each of those uh, that I have down there, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Um, so inspection is basically you look for scars and any visible abnormalities that might be there. Um, we also palpate the organs. So when you're palpating, you're trying to see if organs are firm, tender, if there is any specific type of pain, um, are they mobile or what's their size and things like that. And then we also percuss. So I will just demonstrate, I don't know how much my camera can show here, but for example, let's say I will be percussing to see uh, where exactly a specific, um, um, a specific organs edges are. Um, for example, for liver, we would do that. Or we would also look at the type of sound that we hear from it. And that might clue in um, whether let's say there's fluid in the lungs or um, there's air in the lungs or there's a part that um, the lungs have actually collapsed and we don't, we don't hear as much of a sound there. 
And then we also auscultate afterwards. So we use the stethoscope and listen to the heart. We listen to the, to, to the lungs and bowel sounds. Um, and again, AI could come in handy for, for each one of these. So let's say you can have a camera that could inspect for scars and, and, um, and potentially looking at the scar, be like, oh, this is the type of surgery that might've been done before. Um, or you could have um, recorded sounds of percussion and auscultation um, that might tell you um, something about, about what's happening there as well. And I have some examples in just a bit about those. We also might do some special tests that to, um, to see for, for a specific disease that might, we might be looking for. Um, and that's when the exam is usually focused to look for that specific sign that's associated with the disease that um, we think is, is most likely. Um, so basically we collect a lot of visual, auditory, tactile, and functional data. And again, these, are, these go into the patient's chart as text. Um, and remember the list of, list of differential diagnoses that we, um, we actually had in the beginning, we're gonna narrow them down at this point in, once we've done the physical exam. So there are a few applications of AI for a physical exam right now. So one of them is the echo stethoscope that basically the stethoscope is connected to that mobile app and then uh, it records the information, the, the sounds that you're hearing and it can give us a little bit more information. There is a possibility that we might not hear a specific sound um, while we're listening using our stethoscope or we might hear something that's, we might think that it's totally normal but there is a background sound there uh, going on that might give us a little bit of information about something that's um, that's relevant clinically, but we might not be hearing it um, with our human ears. Um, the Apple Watch is one of the one of the applications of AI there as well that would give you the heart rate. Um, it can do. I, I think the new ones can do ECGs as well, um, but that more so goes into the um, the investigation piece of things. And a live core is another one that I have here that also gives you an ECG, but it also gives you the heart rate, uh, so it can come in handy for a physical exam in there. So once we do a physical exam, we try to determine whether there is a need for, to do more investigations. So we order investigations if, if we need to rule out specific life-threatening possibilities, if there is um, a diagnosis that we have thought clinically, but we want to confirm it using an investigation. Sometimes we want to make sure uh, and understand what the severity of the diagnosis is. Let's say they might, um, we might have uh, diagnosed them with cancer, but what stage of cancer are they? we might have to do biopsies to, to determine that. Um, and we also assess for, com for comorbid issues. So let's say someone comes in with um, uh, kidney failure or kidney problems. Uh, we, this actually kind of limits the, the type of treatments we might, we might be giving them because some of these treatments are gonna be toxic to, to, kid to the kidneys. So we wanna make sure that we either change the dosages or if, if needed, uh, change to a, to a different treatment method. And some of, the, some of the diagnoses that we make are actually very cl clinical and we don't really need extra investigations um, to, for those diagnoses. And, and there are some considerations when, um, when we're thinking about this. Some of them are patient considerations. So what, are, what are the patient's goals? Is the patient going to be uh, you actually getting treatment if they find out they have something specific? If they are not going to do that, what's the point of doing an extra in, uh, investigation? if uh, you're, you've already cl clinically diagnosed them and you don't need to do extra investigations. Uh, age and life expectancy comes in uh, here as well. Uh, so if the patient's life expectancy is lower um, than what you would uh, usually consider in that case, then would you wanna go uh, basically put them through, through a, a potentially invasive um, investigation? And as, and as mentioned before, like unnecessary invasive tests. So do you really want to put, put a patient through an invasive test that's really unnecessary? Um, there's also false negative and positive rates. So no test is 100% reliable. You might come up with something negative when the patient actually has that disease, or you might come up with a positive uh, when the patient does not have that disease. So, um, and you have already diagnosed them clinically. So is there really a need to do inve extra investigations? And health economics comes into play as well. Um, like, let's say you're trying to get an MRI and it, it might take two years to get an MRI if it's not um, too serious. Uh, do you really want to put this patient through that uh, waiting list and potentially have other patients who actually need the MRI wait there as well? So as physicians, um, we're also the wardens of the healthcare system in that sense to try to balance the costs and needs as well. And this is basically big data. There's a lot of considerations, as I mentioned, and, and this is another plug um, for, for AI to come in um, and uh, to potentially help with this as well. 
So the data from, from these investigations that we, we might be doing can be just a positive or negative value. Uh, it could be numerical values. They could be signals and they could be images. So some of the examples I have here, so we might be doing lab work. And for lab work, you'll, you'll look at complete blood count with differential, for example. This will tell you the, uh, the number of uh, specific blood cells that you might see in, 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 in the exam. Um, we look at blood culture if um, we suspect infection. We look at inflammatory markers if we suspect uh, an inflammatory disease. Um, urinalysis, uh, some, of the, some of the conditions show up in, in the urine. And, and so we look at um, the uh, components of that as well. Um, we might look at signals, depending on whether that is needed or not. We could get en electroencephalography, um, which is for the brain or electrocardiography for, for the heart or electromyography for the muscles. Um, some of the some of the imaging modalities we could use pathology to uh, look at a biopsy of of, of a specific tissue. Um, we do X rays, ultrasounds, and and especially with ultrasound, because there's a lot of um, push towards point of care ultrasound, where the ultrasound is basically by the bedside, and the physician can can use it, um, can have it handy there. Um, I, I think AI could actually help with this as well, of trying to look at those ultrasound images of basically point of care ultrasounds. Um, you don't have a radiologist right away there, um, and and the AI uh, software could actually tell us a little bit more about what's what's happening and what what it's seeing in that in that ultrasound. We do CT scans, MRIs, and PET scans as well as needed. Uh, and then genetic testing is another thing. Obviously, it's not as it, 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 genetic testing is not as um, uh, widely used as some of the other modalities that we use. And there, some of them are uh, specifically limited to geneticists, um, but this is also one of, the, one of the tests that we do. So as you can see, there's a huge variety of data for AI to work with, especially when it comes to investigations. And so I have two uh, uh, examples here. On the right side, I have the CBC test. That's the complete blood count. Um, and that's a stock image, so it doesn't really tell you as much. But um, you might have uh, gotten um, lab work done, blood work done before yourself. And, and so um, that's a test tube that, that the blood goes in. And then um, they do investigations on that. And on the left side here, this is an x-ray of someone with a bigger heart. Uh, than it normally should be. So if you see the, um, I, I'm hoping my cursor shows here, if you see the heart, this is actually bigger than what it normally should be. Let's say if I would expect, if I, if I was expecting a normal heart, this probably would be where I should have expected it. Um, but this is a little bigger than uh, what it is. Um, so this tells you that there might be something going on in the heart, uh, let's say heart failure. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a device here, this is a pacemaker. Um, that's put into the heart. Um, and that also kind of confirms that there's something going on in there that uh, this patient has gotten that procedure for that. So some of the AI examples I have for investigations here, um, let's say you wanna, you, you look at a patient and, and they, um, you wanna determine what they're, wh whether they should be referred to a specialist, let's say an ophthalmologist, in the case of diabetic retinopathy, let's say on retinal images. So I have two examples of that here. Um, so the IDXDR is, um, is the first and only FDA authorized AI system for autonomous detection of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so it basically detects the retinopathy itself. And I have uh, another one here, the VARIC, uh, it, it kind of recommends whether you need a consultation with a professional ophthalmologist for further examination. And if you can see here, um, this is basically DR is diabetic retinopathy. And then this is non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy as in it's not progressing. Uh, and then proliferative, proliferative diabetic retinopathy is, as, it, as in it's progressive. And it basically gives you a probability of uh, how much probable each one of these situations are and whether you actually need to be um, seeing a, a, a professional for that or not. Um, so detecting pneumonia from chest x-rays, this is probably one of the most widely heard and used um, things in AI. And, and, and this specific algorithm can, can see lung tumors. Uh, and if you can see here, what they're claiming is that uh, only two out of 15 doctors that, they, uh, that looked at this image detected that there was a lung tumor where the computer actually detected that there was as well. And then in terms of pneumonia, this specific use case uh, computer detected there's pneumonia here, but none of the 15 doctors that looked at it actually detected that. 
Um, and then skin cancer from um, from images of of the skin. So, for example, this is in stock. This is a stock image I have here of, for example, an app on your phone that would look at the uh, skin and tell you whether this is skin cancer or not. And one of the interesting things about this, actually, when I looked at this image, was the fact that it was at 100%. I don't know who actually keeps their battery phone's battery in 100, at 100%. I never see my phone at 100%. So uh, that was an interesting thing to see there. And then their provider is a skin. So I don't know if that exists at any country um, right now, but that was just uh, interesting to see there. Um, and then staining pathology images on, on the computer. This was actually a paper I saw uh, a couple of days ago um, where they would actually look, uh, so, so you, when you get the biopsy from, from the body, uh, when you look at it, you're not going to see it this way. You're going to see it this way, let's say. Um, and then we use chemicals or pathologists use chemicals um, and they stain it. And then based on the staining, you, you, you might see different colors. Um, and based on those colors, you can, you can determine um, what, what's the uh, biological uh, procedure or process that's going on there. Whether, let's say, if it's a cancer or a tumor or something, they can tell you where the borders of that is, for example. Uh, and this AI software actually looks at gets the digi digital image of, of uh, the unstained biopsy, and then it basically stains it for you as if it's been stained chemically on the computer. Um, and so I have two other things here. So um, in, in Canada, we're a little behind in, um, in trying to look at um, AI algorithms and, and, and giving approval for them. Um, so for example, GE, General Electronic, Electric, um, had uh, this uh, basically embedded on device AI algorithm for critical chest X-ray review. Um, and they claimed that it was the first AI algorithm embedded on device uh, to get approval from Health Canada in September of last year. Um, and then XR X-ray or XR AI um, from one qubit, which is a Canadian, I, I believe Vancouver based, uh, AI company got their approval of, of their AI tool for radiology, and they started using it against COVID-19. Uh, there's a bit of controversy about this when I was reading the news about it specifically. I think someone from their team actually said that it doesn't diagnose COVID-19, so um, I am not too sure what exactly they're claiming with that, uh, but it could just be that they are not diagnosing it, but rather giving out information that it could be COVID-19. But so this was also approved last year. I believe um, it was probably in April. I, I think their clinical trials were done in April uh, and then they potentially got approval uh, sometime in May or June of last year in 2020. So once you have all of the, that information, um, we, we go through an assessment phase. So the initial provider assesses the results and, and, and confirms the diagnosis. And some of the diagnoses are assigned an ICD code, which is the International Classification of Diseases. Um, and this is used in some countries and not, not so much in some other countries. I have a few uh, interesting examples of this in the next slide. Um, but this basically will help the physician to come up with a plan and present it to the patient. And so there's a lot of data that we collected in the previous steps. So in this point, at this point, we're going to be going through the decision-making phase. Again, the social determinants of health are going to come in. Um, the goals of care are going to come in. What, what are the goals of the, of, of the patient? Do they want to be resuscitated, for example, if, there's, if something happens? Well, who, who is their beneficiary if something happens? And any, any other comorbidities? I mentioned kidney failure. If the patient has problems with their kidneys, do we really want to, get, uh, do we really want to give them that treatment that we thought uh, might be the first line? So these are some of the interesting um, ICD codes that I just have here just for, uh, for the sake of having them here. And as you can see, there's like picked by a chicken, for example, is, is one of the ICD codes or problems in relationship with in-laws. Um, and so there, uh, it, it's a pretty comprehensive list of, um, list of things in, in the ICD codes. And then once you have you go through all of those assessments, you you come up with a plan. The complexity of the diagnosis is going to determine how we manage the patient care. So if the, if this situation is very complex, they might need to go to the ICU. Um, if it's not as complex as an ICU case, then um, they get admitted to an inpatient ward. If not, then an outpatient require a, a appointment would be fine. And sometimes if it's just uh, the the results of uh, the X rays, uh, let's say were normal, then that would be a phone follow up and. There might, they might be referred to a specialist in this, in this situation as well. And that specialist is gonna take uh, additional history and physical exam, might do some investigations. And they either confirm the same diagnosis that the GP came up with, or they might come up with, a, with an alternative diagnosis. And then the follow-up care uh, is gonna be determined based on the complexity. So the specialist might be following up themselves, or they might 
um, refer it back to the to the GP, or they might refer them to the hospital because this might be something that's potentially serious and has to be dealt with pretty um, uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then the adjustments to those plans are are made once once we see how the patient respond to those. And and that comes back to, to outcomes that I will just touch on in the next slide. But some of the examples of plans we would do if someone comes in, let's say with a strep throat, um, we might uh, provide them with a prescription for a specific pill that they will be taking X times a day and they might be, they, they will come back and follow up in about two weeks. If there's broken hip, uh, they do hip replacement surgery and follow up in six weeks. Um, or a sports injury, use brace physiotherapy and come up for, for follow up. Depression, we might send them for psychological counseling. Cancer, we might do palliative care if it's a terminal diagnosis. Um, and we also have watch and wait as, as, as a plan. So if someone comes in with common cold, um, which is a condition that basically is self-limiting and it resolves on itself, then we just watch and wait. Um, and then when it comes to outcomes, so the treatment outcomes are monitored. As I mentioned before in the plan, we, we look at side effects, at risk reactions, successes and failures and things like that. Um, all of this is actually recorded in a confidential chart um, it's the same chart that we were talking about from the beginning um, and is going to be used to inform the care of, of the patient. Um, and the prognosis and any changes to patient care can be determined using this. So AI applications, again, could come in handy here. Um, they could be predicting hospital readmission rates. They could be used in cancer classification and prognosis. They could be identifying genetic risk factors um, based on treatment outcomes um, of, of a specific case. So one thing I wanted to mention and basically leave you with uh, is the privacy and safety. So access to healthcare and patient data is very difficult. If you're not a part of the care team, it's very difficult to get, get, get to that data. Um, there are ways to do that, um, but it is, it is a still a, a challenge. Um, and use cases can, can actually be limited as well. So informed consent uh, may be required. And the reason I have that, that may be in there is because of the... Uh, dichotomy between, for example, retrospective and prospective studies. So if you go back and use uh, a bunch of pneumonia cases, pneumonia x-rays, um, do you really have to get consent from all of those 500 to 1,000 patients potentially that um, you're, you're using their images there? And there's a lot of ethical and policy questions in there that I won't really get into, but just, just a thought um, to actually think about as well. And the regulations depend on the healthcare systems and countries. Uh, so you, if you look at the US, for example, some some hospitals, they have their own regulations and how they how they deal with um, data requests and things like that. Um, depending on the country and the healthcare system, this this might be different. And one of the things that's that's there is that can AI actually learn from its mistakes? And 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 the thing is, when regulatory bodies give um, give approval to these um, to these algorithms, do they give locked approval? as it's called, or adaptive approval? Can the AI system actually adapt as it goes and potentially change and is gonna be a totally different algorithm at some point in time? And do they have that um, uh, limited certification from the beginning or do they have an all encompassing certification that they can do, uh, they can adapt as they go or not? So some of, these are some of the things that, that I just wanted to leave you with. Um, and an interesting thing in the news is the Clairview AI um, company, which is something that was being used in Canada. And I think I, our CMP was actually one of, one of the last remaining clients in Canada. And they stepped out of Canada in July of last year. And then their software um, was, um, they were, uh, I don't know why my slide is not showing that other one, um, but you might've seen it in the news that um, the Clear, Clearview AI is being used to, to look at the, uh, basically for facial recognition of people who raided the Capitol in the US a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so, which part of the political spectrum you are in and um, whether you wanna agree with this in terms of privacy or not, that's just another thing that I would like to leave you with just a thought um, for that as well. And so just to recap, we talked a little bit about medicine and healthcare. Um, we talked about the uh, sample workflow of going from presentation, history, physical exam, the investigations we might or we might not do, the assessments, plans, and the outcomes of those. Um, and then we touched a little bit on privacy and safety. Uh, so I hope that was a whirlwind tour of what happens in medicine, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that are there at this point.
So we have one question in the chat. How exactly effective are these technologies used in physical exams, like the Apple Watch or the Echo stethoscope? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, there is, um, I think it kind of depends on who you talk to and what exactly is the measure you're, uh, you're using for effectiveness. So uh, there are a lot of different measures that we use in AI, let's say the accuracy or recall or precision, which is, which is all three are actually the ones that uh, X-ray in Canada uh, got that approval for, for pneumonia. Um, but there are also F1 scores, let's say, or the J index or the AUC curve. Um, so it, it kind of depends on who you're asking. And, and this is actually one of the things that I have a, a bit of a challenge with myself is trying to understand whether we are um, looking at something that is, is going to defeat a bunch of physicians and is better than a bunch of physicians that listening to a specific, um, a specific sign, or are we using this in a low resource setting where there's no other physicians and it might just tell us the generality of what's going on. So it's, uh, I, I think it kind of depends on who you are asking. Um, some of these things like the heart rate, for example, is, is a very um, basic vital sign. Um, so most of these devices by now are, are pretty accurate when it comes to that. Um, but when it comes to um, other things, they they haven't been tested as much, I think. So um, really, it kind of depends on, like I said, who you talk to. And if I can add for the echo stethoscope, uh, they claim that it can detect atrial fibrillation with 99% sensitivity, 97% specificity, and hard to hear murmurs with similar values of uh, 87%. But there's also, medicine is very resistant to change, especially if it costs more than the usual stethoscope. So actual practical use of it is quite limited. And we have another question. <clears throat> if I recall correctly, you mentioned that each hospital may have its own regulation. What are some examples of this? I would have guessed there are only regional regulations. All the hospitals in Edmonton have the same regulations and process for dealing with data. So th this is this is a very good question. And, and, and like I said, it kind of depends on the country you go to. So for example, in Canada, our, our healthcare provision is provincial. So most of these things are in Alberta, let's say, are, are handled through AHS. Uh, and so you'd have to go through the, the uh, central AHS for that. Um, but for example, in the US, some of the hospitals, they have their own system. Let's say the Henry Ford Hospital, they, they deal with their own, um, their own data regulations. So it kind of, like I said, it kind of depends on which country you go to. Uh, but for example, here in Alberta, we would, you would be talking to AHS for that. And also, uh, there's another complicating factor in that the lab at the lab that processes all the investigations at U of A, for example, could ha could have different uh, variability than one down in Calgary, and so you have to calibrate every specific test to a specific location. Uh, there can be difficulties comparing values from one place to another because of that. So that's all the questions in the chat. Any other questions? That sounds like a no. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, wait. What do you expect the future of AI to be? Oh, that's, that's a million dollar question. Um, I actually don't know. Um, maybe an auto dock um, in a, on a spaceship um, or um, so that, that's, yeah, like, like I said, that's a million dollar question. It's like, um, we do have a lot of AI solutions in medicine. Um, so the, the decision-making helper systems, for example, that are, that are helping physicians make those decisions. Like I said, the pneumonia chest X-ray thing. Um, but we, the, the general AI has not been used in medicine at all so far. And 
to be honest, I don't know where that will be going. Um, but the thing is, right now, there's a lot of AI algorithms that can surpass the the the, the physician's expertise, um, and so that that could potentially be the improvement that, that that could be made in in the algorithms that are out there right now. When the general AI could be used, I have no idea. Another question. If medicine is slow to adopt technology, will medicine look quite different five years from now, 10 years, or, or will it be quite slow? That's also a good question. Medicine has been historically um, one of those fields that has been a little slow to adapt. And again, those regulations that we just talked about, policies and ethics come in uh, come into play as well. Um, I believe it is evolving. Even the pace of e evolution is evolving. Um, so I would potentially expect changes and um, pretty good changes in potentially five to 10 years. Yeah. But also keep in mind, Alberta is just shifting over to electronic charting now. So there's quite a delay. So how should we get patients to trust AI in healthcare? And a similar question, how do we get doctors to trust AI in healthcare? Um, those are actually also really good questions. And, and, and there, is, there is some, um, I guess, reservations uh, when it comes to involving AI in healthcare. There are some doctors, especially the ones from the older generation that don't trust anything other than experience, and uh, and so it'll it is it is harder to to get them to to do that. But one of the interesting things that that's happened uh, in the last year or so is, as Shane mentioned, Alberta is going through um, a new phase of trying to implement electronic medical records for the whole province. Um, and so initially, when this came about, a lot of physicians were apprehensive about trying to go on it and how they had to deal with all these extra notifications and errors or warnings that they might get when they're prescribing something specific. But as they went through it and as they started learning about it, they actually figured out that, oh, we can use this to our advantage. It's actually helping me uh, do my job better. Uh, it's potentially taking care of some of the mistakes that I, I might have in there. Or there are some sandbox um, uh, potential potentials and opportunities for in, in those EMRs that AI systems could come in and could potentially give you as um, a, a, I guess, a suggestion for a specific diagnosis. So I think it, it's, it's becoming a little, um, like doctors are becoming more um, okay with, with trying to use these AI solutions. And patients, um, I honestly haven't really talked to many about it. Um, I, I think that is also changing as well, but um, I don't know if anyone else has, has any other, um, I don't know, Shane, if you've heard anything about that, or have you've talked to patients about it at all. Well, I'd say that the person asking the question is, is the patient, like what would, what would it take for you to trust AI in healthcare? Ask yourselves that question. Will you ever trust an AI? Another question, how can or how long will it take for an AI to be developed in order for them to accurately diagnose a patient? Um, I mean, like it, in, in medicine right now with, with all the human experience and expertise, we still make mistakes. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, diagnoses that might not be right initially. So I honestly don't know the answer to that question of um, how long it'll actually take for us to, to come up with a general AI that can fully diagnose a specific um, disease by just looking at it. There are some that'll diagnose like a yes or no for very specific conditions, but that's already with after it's gone through multiple levels of human review to, to decide that, okay, it's either this or this or this. Let's, let's put the AI to the task. Another question, how should data quality be enforced in these scenarios? Are there steps being taken? Uh, these scenarios, as in, are we talking about uh, the patients and physicians being apprehensive about it or in general? Healthcare in general. Oh, okay. Um, well, um, I think the, the people who have worked with health data before probably know that even though there should be a 
um, a, a general framework of, uh, of how the data it needs to be structured, it might not be as structured as you might think. And especially when you look at the text data from the, from the charts, every physician, every nurse, every person who is actually making those charts is going to have their own way of making those charts. So there's not really a big, um, even, even though we use the SOAP notes, for example, um, there's not really a big um, push towards, oh, make sure you're using it in this exact scenario. Um, so th there's not really a lot of enforcement in that sense. Um, when it comes to AI, when you're collecting data specifically for an AI project, then that's a little different because that's a research project. And in that case, you would have that structure um, to, to your data. But when you're looking at the retrospective data from the previous healthcare encounters, that's a little bit different and usually uh, not really that structured. So I guess that's a challenge if you want to get into the data in healthcare. And writing up the charts is usually the doctor's least favorite thing to do. <laughs> and so if you tell them, oh, now you have to do it this way and only this way, there's going to be pushback. And another question, are SOAP notes shared with multiple healthcare providers? For example, does your family doctor share the notes with a specialist or a nurse? That is a very good question. So um, a lot of family docs, because their clinics are, are private clinics of, of their own, basically they, they are either a, um, they own it with a, with a few other family docs or they are the uh, sole owner of that clinic. They usually have their own electronic medical record system. So they, uh, they put their charts in there, but that chart usually does not get shared with anyone unless they actually share it in a referral. So when you're when they're referring you to a, to a, referring a patient to a specialist, uh, in that case, they would, take out some of the important information from that chart and, and, and make it um, and put it in a referral letter. But otherwise, uh, those information uh, stay in, in, the, in that specific clinic. As a patient, you can ask for that data, but otherwise the, that, that data is, is, is a part of that clinic and, and, and it gets stored there. It's different when you, when you get seen in a hospital the hospitals have are part of that bigger network of electronic medical records and family docs actually have access to that, uh, to that big, uh, network as well. Um, and so if you, if they send you for, for imaging, let's say, um, that MRI, for example, is going to come into the family doc and is going to stay in the provincial medical record system. Um, and so the other physicians that are seeing you afterwards, they have access to that MRI image as well. And another question. Is the fact that AI coming into medicine is a slow process only for the benefit of patients, or is it some factors of selfishness on the healthcare provider's behalf? Well, uh, this is being recorded, so I don't know if I want to shoot myself in the foot. Um, I but can stop the recording I... now. 